All right. Well, good morning, everyone. I think you're all still kind of asleep from our spring ahead here. <laughs> well, let's stand and, and wake ourselves up here with Sing, Sing, Sing. Good morning. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Is anybody tired this morning? I just want you to know that when we installed the new pew pads last week, we also installed some little sensors. So if I see any of you falling asleep, I have a little button that I push here, and you'll feel a little jolt. It's just enough to wake you up. I'm just, just joking. Let's, uh, let's pray this together this morning. Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to be gathered in your house. And... Uh, For most of us this morning, getting up a little bit earlier than we're used to and uh, just feeling the crispness of the morning air, remembering how awesome your creation is. We thank you for this day that we can be together and worship you. Father, as we come into this place, we come in with various burdens, various concerns, and we take time now to release those to you so that we can focus on you and focus on worshiping you. Thank you that you're here with us. And we pray that you would speak to each of our hearts this morning, that we would leave this place looking more like you than when we came in. In your name we pray, amen. And you may be seated. 
All right, we have a number of announcements this morning. And uh, one of them is uh, today is daylight savings time. So we're not going to count until about uh, 1130 because that's when most people are going to be getting here because they forgot. I'm just joking. Um, But uh, if we can go ahead and switch over to the proclaim and uh, we'll get the announcements going. Um, Today we've got a meeting, our prayer committee meeting will be at uh, 5 o'clock today. And this coming Wednesday is our finance committee and building committee meeting at 7 And then also our church church board meeting will be at 8 o'clock this week. Um, On the menu for our Wednesday evening meal this week is sloppy joes and potato salad. So it looks like it'll be a great meal. encourage you if you're um, coming for meetings, attention board, it's a good idea just to come a little bit earlier and enjoy a meal. Uh, But uh, be a great time to fellowship together. And uh, of course my presentation went off air because it's that time of morning. Um, This Saturday... In the gym, there's going to be a fiesta in the, uh, for the middle and sunshine group. Um, it's going to be a, a great time. Stop laughing, Wayne. I'm trying to be nice this morning. <laughs> the, uh, the sunshine group, in case you're wondering, is what comes after middle age. Then you become a sunshine group. Um, our middle age group really needs a name, so I don't face this every week when I make these announcements. Um, but anyway, 5 o'clock at the gym, it's going to be a great time of uh, Mexican food and fellowship, so I encourage you to, uh, to participate in that. If you're interested, there's a sign-up sheet in the foyer, and I uh, would encourage you to sign up so that uh, we don't have 10,000 tacos and no corn. Um, the last Sunday of this month, which is two Sundays away, we're going to be taking our annual alabaster, or semi-annual alabaster offering. And the alabaster offering, we're a month off on this, uh, but our alabaster offering goes for the uh, the building of church buildings all around the world. And every year, twice a year, Nazarene churches collect their change, and then we combine this all across the, the world, and we bring in millions of dollars worth of change worldwide. And this is uh, money monies that are used to build churches um, all around the world, and uh, churches and hospitals and uh, and clinics. Uh, it's awesome for us to collect the change that we would save for a soda pop and see God build a church building or a hospital out of it in a third world country. So we're excited about that. I also want to let you know, um, for our kids, the kids are in children's church this morning, but for those of you that are here this morning who remember VBS last summer, you remember the offering that we took at VBS last summer? We took a, an offering for clean water for Haiti. And the offering last summer, we raised 700 and some dollars for this clean offering, or clean water offering. And the team that we are sponsoring is in Haiti this week installing that clean water system. Now, the way that it works is in Haiti, we can give $1 and get clean water for a year for one person. So we, they're installing a system that will allow the $732 that we raised to give 732 people in Haiti clean water for a year. And so we're excited to be able to participate in that. And I just encourage you to be praying for this team from Tabor, Iowa, as they uh, install the the water system this week. And then uh, April 1st, can you believe that we're already in the middle of March? Where did February go? Where did January go? Anyway, um, I'm not complaining because I'm glad that we're past that big snow threat. Um, Sunday, April 1st, we will be having a combined Quad City Nazarene Church um, a, uh, Palm Sunday service. And we, we got together on a Sunday night at Christmas and had a great turnout, a great time. And so we're going to try this again on a Sunday night. We'll do Palm Sunday. And uh, we've got a great service planned. It's going to be a great time to, uh, to be together as uh, Quad City Nazarenes. And uh, this will be at Kelowna, and we'll have uh, maps available, and then we'll probably take the church vans over again. So if you're interested in going, uh, just let me know, and we'll, we'll plan on having that uh, set up for you. I think that's enough. Yeah, that goes up to my sermon, so we don't want to go that far yet. <clears throat> I think that's enough announcements today. You think so? All right, I'm ready to sing. We're going to sing together now, What a Day That Will Be. So stand up and get ready to sing an old hymn. <laughs>
communion with us this morning, Bree. As we come together this morning, I know that we all have concerns. I know that we all have challenges. I know that there are things going on in all of our lives that seem overwhelming at times. And this morning as we come together, one of the privileges that we have of coming together in this place is the opportunity to come before our God and Creator of all and bringing our concerns, bringing our cares and these things that overwhelm us and laying them at His feet. So as we move into a time of prayer, if you've got a prayer request that you want us to pray for publicly, then fill out the prayer cards and pass those to the center aisle. If you've got a concern that you would like to bring to the altars this morning, our altars are open at this time. And we just encourage you to find whatever position of prayer is comfortable. If you want to sit down, if you want to remain standing, if you want to come and kneel at the altars, whatever is the most comfort, comfortable for you, we don't want you to be distracted by anything else. We just want you to look at Jesus and bring your concerns to him this morning. Let's sing through this song again.
Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, we truly are desperate for you. Lord, we acknowledge that in this world, while there are many things that we can control, there's many things that we can have our hands in, there are many things that we cannot control. As good of medical help that is available in our culture today, there are many things that medical help cannot help with. As good as we are at many things, there are many things that are just beyond our control. And this morning, Lord, we come before you and admit our utter dependence upon you. We're not here this morning to look good. We're not here this morning to, um, to come across well. We're here this morning because we are desperately in need of our Creator and in need of your touch in our lives, your guidance in our lives. Father, this morning as we gather together, I know that there are a multitude of burdens and concerns weighing heavily upon hearts. And we take time now to lift up those concerns that are weighing heavily upon our hearts. And we lift those to you in silent prayer now. Father, there are many concerns that we hold privately. There are many concerns that are public, and we pray for those at this time as well. I pray this morning for Dolores Hayden, who's in the hospital this morning. And I just pray that you would be with Dolores and Merle in this time, be with with Judy and Carol and the rest of the kids. Father, it's uh, very overwhelming for them right now to, to see all of the health concerns with Merle's cancer and with Dolores. We just pray that you would surround them with your love and your grace in this time. Father, we lift up the the others who have been struggling physically. We lift up Carl Jones this morning. And we just ask for your touch upon Carl, Lord. You know his situation, and I just pray that you'll be with Carl in a very special way and be with Doris during these days as well. We continue to pray for Brandon Randleman and the tests that he's undergoing, trying to figure out what's going on with him. We continue to pray for Katie Shoemaker and her healing as she had her appendix out this week. And uh, just pray that you'll be with with Katie. And Father, we lift up the missions team from Tabor, Iowa, as they are in Haiti this week, doing the work that we have helped them to do, but a work that is so necessary. Father, we take clean water so for granted. And in Haiti, that's not a privilege, or that's not a right, that's a privilege. Here it's a right, everybody's entitled to it. But I pray, Father, that you would be with our team, that you would keep them safe physically, that you would touch their hearts in such a way emotionally and spiritually that that they would not return the same. They would not just feel like they came back and helped somebody, but that they made an eternal difference in the lives of people and in their own lives as well. Father, I thank you for our denomination, the Nazarene Church, and for what it allows us to accomplish. The teamwork that we have, the network that we have that allows us to make a difference in nations all around the world. Over 153 nations where we're able to to be serving and drawing people into relationship with you. And we pray for the the multitudes in Haiti. As our lives have moved on, it's been almost three years now, or over three years since the, the shock of this earthquake, and yet their lives are still many in shambles. Thank you for those who are providing that care, and help us to not grow so calloused. Father, we pray for our military this morning, and we lift up those who are, are serving. We think of our own loved ones from our congregation. We lift those up before you this morning. Father, we're thankful that you are there with them. And we just pray for your hand of protection to be upon them as they serve. Father, there are many times that the words that we say don't seem to do justice to the level of emotions that we're feeling. 
they don't seem to do justice to the level of hurt and desperation that we see in the world around us. And in times like these, we pray together the prayer that your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we also have forgiven our trespassers. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And you may be seated. Thank you.
one more time. And holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With the creation I sing, praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything. So we sing that one more time. Just that last a cappella section. Can you imagine what it's going to be like when we stand in heaven? When we get to stand and watch the face of our Savior. And all of the pain of life is over. And we get to stand and see Jesus. Can you imagine what it's going to be like to hear the voices of billions of Christians throughout the centuries? those that we've read about in the Bible and those that have lived before and since, and join with the angels as they sing around the throne, holy, holy, holy. Close your eyes as you sing this and imagine what that's going to be like. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything. You are my everything. You are my everything. And I You may be seated. If our ushers will come forward at this time, we'll take our morning tithes and offerings. Jack, will you pray for us this morning? Heavenly Father, you're an awesome God. You are King of kings. You are Lord of lords. We adore you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your compassion. We thank you for helping us in our finances. Continue to help us to give back to you like only you can deserve. You're an awesome God and Father, and we love you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team, for a wonderful job this morning. They told me when we were having prayer before service that there were some good songs that would think making them cry already, so to expect it. And what an awesome God we serve. What an awesome God we serve. Well, this morning as we have continued in our New Testament in a year reading, we have um, once again crossed the line in this Gospel of Mark from where... It's Jesus healing and doing exciting things to now we're starting to approach Jerusalem. We're starting to approach the difficult part of Christianity. The reality that it's not all sunshine and roses. The reality that being a Christian costs us something. The title of the message this morning is, What is it worth? What is it worth? Dave, could I get your help for a minute? Could I get you to just unwind this rope and take it out all the way to the foyer? It'll reach. I did it this morning. I didn't wind it up as neatly as it came again, so... All right, Joe, in just a few minutes, I'm going to have you come up, and Dave and I are going to... Just joking. <laughs> I better hush. I was asked by your wife to come and jump rope with the kids, or hula hoop, I think it's what it was, in caravans. And I said, I'm sorry, I can't do that. All right, Dave, you can just set it down there. Thank you. (laughs) 
It's a pretty long rope. It's 100 foot. I didn't extend all of it. Have you ever thought about what eternity is going to be like? What is eternity? I mean, can you even fathom what eternity is? Forever? What is forever look like? Now, this illustration, Brian mentioned this to me from, it's an illustration that Francis Chan has used. It's an illustration that reminds us of how short our time on earth really is. Now, if you adjust your bifocals, you can see I've got four different colors of tape at the end of this. If you imagine that there's the time of our birth, then our childhood years, our working years, and our retirement years. Not all of us get all the way to the retirement years. But if you see the scope of of this, how short this is in comparison to the length of this rope. I mean, you recognize that we put all of our emphasis in life on this and completely ignore that. Think about this. We're, we're going to live between 50 and 80 years if we're lucky. Some of us live older to, than that. Some of us will go sooner than that. And then we have all eternity. And the question is, what are we investing in? What is really important to us? Because if you watch TV or if you talk to most people in our culture, we work really hard in this yellow stage so that we can set aside as much money as we can so we can enjoy this green stage. I thought about actually kind of making this more accurate and just taking a pen and marking a line around this for the retirement stage because we're not guaranteed anything. My parents, as many people have done, were planning for their retirement until my dad died at the age of 58 and never got there. We've had way too many funerals for young people in this church lately. We're not guaranteed that retirement, but yet when you look at what we're living for, what we're investing in, what we're spending our time working for, it's this much. And we're ignoring all of that. I wanted to do this illustration early in the service because I want to leave this here for us to look at and pay attention to. If you've got your Bibles with you, if you would open up to Mark chapter 8, starting in verse 34. Then calling the crowds to join his disciples, he said, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? Jesus starts this section out. by He's got a crowd of people that have followed him. They're waiting for the next miracle. Jesus has just pulled his disciples aside and told them, I'm going to die. He's told his disciples... I'm going to go to Jerusalem. That's where we're headed now. We're walking in that direction. And when I get there, they're going to beat me. They're going to hang me on a cross and kill me. His disciples are not understanding, as Mark wrote. They just didn't get it. Because that's not what they expected life to be about. You see, here's the problem We've bought into this lie in our culture, and this this lie has been going on for a really long time, that it's all about what takes place when we're taking breaths on this earth. That's what it's all about. When When we're dead, who cares what happens there? It's all about now. 
But Jesus tells us the exact opposite message. Jesus tells us it's not about now. Who cares about now? Because now is going to fade. Everything that you hold on dearly to, all of your trinkets, all of your, your special things, are going to be in a landfill someday. Don't worry about now. What's eternity look like? What does the rest of this rope look like? Jesus pulls the entire crowd back after telling his disciples that he was going to die. He pulls the whole crowd back into this conversation. Jesus would not do very well in church growth movement classes. Because you see, in church growth movement classes, they tell us to get the biggest crowd that you can get. Jesus had a way of winnowing that big crowd down to a small one. If I were to stand up here today and tell you that if any of you want to follow me, then stand up and I'm going to pull the trigger on a gun. You're not going to stand up. You're going to get on your knees and you're going to crawl to the back door and hope that I don't shoot. Jesus says to his disciples and to the crowds that are thronged around them, if you're not willing to give up your life for me, don't waste your energy trying to follow me now. Because it's not about this. He starts out by saying, turn from your selfish ways. I wish he would have phrased this differently. I wish he would have said, make sure you acknowledge me at least in some things. You know, because that's a whole lot easier, isn't it? To say, yeah, we acknowledge Jesus in some things. We go to church on Sundays, even this crowd today, even when it's daylight savings you got here. That's worth something, isn't it? We all lost an hour of sleep that we could have made up. Wouldn't it be easier if he said, just follow me kind of. But he doesn't say that. He says, turn from your selfish ways. Turn from your selfish ways. Has anybody in this room ever struggled with selfishness? Okay, some of you are like, no... You're lying. We all struggle with selfishness. We all struggle with selfishness. And Jesus knows that this is the heart of the sin nature within us. You see, when Satan tempted Eve in the garden, all he had to do was say, oh, don't you realize you could get something better? Don't you realize you could be as smart as God? And her selfish way said, oh yeah, I'm all over that. I'll show my husband something. Some of you got that. (laughs) Jesus says, turn from your selfish ways. Because he knows that all of us are prone to follow our selfish ways. Is everybody enjoying our new pew pads this morning? Very comfortable compared to what we had before? I just want to acknowledge that those pew pads are there because of our selfish ways. Because if we just had, had you standing or sitting on the floor, we would not have as big of a crowd this morning. We acknowledge that we all have selfish ways and we like padding where we sit. And so we put in pews. Then we put in pew pads. People have already been asking me, when are we going to do the backs? Because everywhere we turn, we're used to our selfish ways. How many of you walked to church this morning? Anybody walked to church this morning? How many of you listened to the radio on your way to church this morning? How many of you couldn't determine if you were going to turn on the heat or the air conditioner in your car this morning? How many of you spouses fought over which one was on? You see, everything in our culture is designed to make us comfortable. We sleep on nice, soft beds. We drive comfortable vehicles. 
I mean, some of you may be saying, you ain't seen mine, and well, you didn't walk, did you? We are so comfortable in our culture. We keep coming up with new inventions to make us more and more comfortable. Jesus says, turn from your selfish ways. Take up your cross. I really wish you would have phrased this one differently too. I wish you would have said, think about the cross. If I've got to turn from my selfish ways, if he could at least say, just think about the cross. I mean, we like to do that, don't we? We're coming up on Easter season. We've got the cross in this church. It's three crosses at the both ends of each of our altars. It's on the pulpit. It's on the communion table. We've got them on the wall. We want you to be thinking about the cross. The cross is important to us. But he doesn't say just think about the cross. He says take up your cross. He says be willing to give absolutely everything and endure suffering for me. In other words, and he's telling this to the crowds who have been chasing after him, waiting for the next miracle to take place. He's telling them, don't just follow me so that I can fill your belly or you can see somebody being healed. Follow me if you're willing to take up your cross. And follow me. What what does follow me mean? Dave, when I asked you to come up and help, I didn't tell you this beforehand. You had no idea that was coming. But when, you, when I asked you to help, you got up and you came and you asked me what I wanted you to do. And I gave you directions. You followed my directions very well. Follow me means when I say something, you listen and you follow directions. It's a very simple concept. It should be anyway. Try telling a three-year-old, but it should be simple anyway. Follow me. When Jesus says, follow me, he means just that. How many of you remember playing the game Simon Says when you were growing up? Most of you played Simon Says. Some of you are raising your hands like he's not going to make us do that today, is he? (laughs) No, I'm not. Simon Says is a game that says, do what the leader is doing. When he says, Simon says. See, we don't play Simon says by saying, Simon says jump up and down and somebody's sitting on the couch saying, oh yeah, I'm doing that in my heart. I'm thinking about it. You lose if you just play it in your heart. That's not the way God works. That's not the way Scripture is written. He doesn't just say, think about me sometimes. And when you feel like it, follow me, at least in your heart. He says, turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross, and follow me. Now this is one of those statements that if we didn't have this whole rope to worry about or to think about, this statement makes no sense whatsoever. If we don't believe in eternity, ignore what Jesus just said here, because you know, like there's no reason to suffer if it's all about now. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to go back to selling roofs if it's all about now because I made a whole lot more money and worked a whole lot less hours if it's just about now. But it's not just about now. It's not about what is easy and comfortable. It is about turning from our selfish ways, taking up our cross and following Him so that we can live with Him for all of eternity. Why? He gives us a pretty interesting follow-up statement here. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. You ever experienced this? You've got something, you're in a relationship with someone, whether it's a spouse or a friendship, and you're trying with everything that you can to hold on to that, and yet you see it slipping through your fingers? You finally get that nest egg built up and the washing machine goes out 
You, you finally save some money and then this goes out or that goes out. That's, that's the way that life is. You're not going to be able to hold on to anything forever. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. Why? Because it's not all about this. If I were to say, Dave, I want you to go down to the Mississippi River today and there's going to be a group of people jump in. And I want you to take this rope and be watching so that you can pull them out because the water is still a little bit too chilly. Would you want to take this section of rope or would you want to take the rest of the rope? The big section. The big section. Because there's not enough room on this little section for you to grab a hold of and get it out to them. I mean, you could cut this off and throw it at them. But like, <laughs> help yourself. See, it's all of life. It's all that matters. I mean, it's a pretty basic concept. You didn't have to think about that too hard. It's not a trick question. If we try to hang on to stuff, then that distracts us from actually doing what is important. But if we say, you know what, nothing else matters except for Jesus and the gospel, it's amazing how things fall into place. You know, Jesus phrased this another way back in Matthew chapter 6. He said, seek first my kingdom and my righteousness and everything else will be taken care of. You see, if we just try to live for now, we're going to lose everything that we have. If we just try to live for the green... What happens when we die? And none of this goes with us. Do you recognize that one of Satan's biggest ploys against Christians is to keep us busy doing good things? Because he would certainly prefer us to do a whole ton of good things and not have time for what is really important, the gospel, than he would to see us just focus on the gospel. If we try to hang on to good things, I mean, I'm not saying our lives are bad. I'm not saying these pew pads are bad. I'm kind of thankful for them. But if we try to hang on to these, we're going to lose our lives. We're going to lose everything if that's all we're looking at. If we're just looking for as many good things as we can do, but missing the important things of the gospel, what a waste of time. Because it's all going to rust. It's all going to rot. It's all going to be in a landfill someday. What do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but lose your soul? This is the verse that's been running through my head all week. Toby Mack, some of you know who Toby Mack is. Toby Mack is, was a part of DC Talk, is now a solo artist, a rap artist. I joke with the worship team this week and ask them if they do Toby Mack. And then we decided that half of you wouldn't be able to understand what they were saying anyway, so we wouldn't go there. But he sings a song and says, I don't want to gain the whole world but lose my soul. And he talks in this song about what he gives as an artist in order to make the money, but yet he doesn't want to give everything and lose his soul. What do you benefit if you gain the whole world? What do you benefit if you are the richest person in the world for the entire green spectrum here? You know what you gain? A funeral just like everybody else will get. And when you're gone... Your kids or whoever you leave the money to are going to spend it on things that you didn't want it spent on. You know that? I mean, that's the way it goes. Why do you spend all of your time focusing on this 
And then you spend all of eternity, all of the white section, you're in eternal turmoil. I went to the Christian bookstore this week and I bought two books. One of them was a book that I've been needing to read for a long time. It's come highly recommended. It's called Heaven is for Real. Heaven is for Real was written by Todd Burpo, who pastors the Westland Church in Imperial, Nebraska. Anybody know where Imperial, Nebraska is this morning? I have some people from McCook here this morning, so they know where Imperial's at. McCook is mentioned in the Imperial. That's the closest to Walmart to Imperial. It's an hour plus away. And I read this book, and I, I read as this little boy described what it was like when he was in heaven. He had a, an appendix rupture and ended up dying on the operating table, going to heaven, and then was revived and brought back. Which Jesus told him was a direct result of his father's prayer. It's a powerful book. The other book that I picked up this week was not as feel-good of a book. It's called Erasing Hell. And talking about the fact that in our culture we don't want to talk about hell. We, we love to talk about heaven. Everybody's going to heaven. But we don't want to talk about hell. But the reality is, there is a heaven and there is a hell. And we will spend all of this white portion somewhere. I'm not trying to scare anybody this morning. I, I don't want the fear of hell to be your motivation for everything you do. I want your love for Jesus to be the motivation for everything you do. I want you to fall in love with Jesus and see who Jesus is to the point that, yeah, you know what? I'm willing to give up now so that I can spend all of this time looking at Jesus' face. But I need you to understand This white rope is in the middle for this entire service for a reason. I keep grabbing it and I'm hoping that when you're dreaming tonight, you're going to see this white rope. You know when you do something enough times during the day, it comes out in your dreams? Very scary when I was working at Dairy Queen and frying fish all night long. I want this to stick with you. That's why I keep grabbing at it. Because I know that... Three hours from now, you're going to be thinking about what you had for lunch and you ate too much or you didn't eat enough and you're going to forget everything I said, but I want you to remember this. And what are you doing with this? What do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? We're all going to die. And you may die the richest person in the world and you're still just as dead as the poorest. What do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? I want you to do a mental checklist now. I want you to run through the things that you have listed on your insurance policies. What are the valuables that you insure, whether it be furniture, whether it be jewelry, whether it be, for me, computers? What is it that is listed on your insurance policy? What do you value? And then I want you to compare it to eternity. Is it worth more than this? It's a very simple question. It should not be easy or hard question for us to answer. I mean, truthfully, most of you are sitting there shaking your heads, yeah, you're right, you're right. We don't disagree with what Jesus said. But there's a huge difference in agreeing with what Jesus said and living what Jesus said. Because you know, I agree with a whole lot of people, but I'm not going to live my life in that way. I'm not going to live my life just because I agree with what somebody says, sell everything and follow them. Jesus, on the other hand, yeah. Because I'm not just talking about somebody here on this earth. You know, this week I got some terrible news. The Indianapolis Colts released Peyton Manning and the rest of their team. 
I had my tissues ready as I was watching the newscast. I didn't need them, but I had them ready. And now the, the media frenzy has been following Peyton Manning around. Where is he at today? He was in Denver. I don't want him to go to Denver. He's in Arizona today. He's going to Miami later this week. You know what? I'm not selling every Colt shirt that I have because Peyton Manning's not there anymore. Because you know what? Peyton Manning was going to retire eventually anyway. It's not all about Peyton Manning or any other player in the NFL. Because eventually they're going to be gone. I wouldn't sell anything to go see Peyton Manning. It's just not worth that for me. I'm not talking about a human here. I'm talking about Jesus. I'm not talking about a momentary blip. I mean, if you take this and you put a little line in the, in the yellow, can anybody see that line? That's the significance of most of what we die for. Is it worth, there's anything worth more than your soul? Then Jesus adds this follow up that, man, I really wish you wouldn't have said. In case you are wondering, I'm not thrilled with this passage being in Scripture. It's one of those passages that I look at and say, Jesus, you really could have said this in a much nicer way. But as I was reading the passages this week, this is the passage that Jesus stood up and said, I said that. So whether you wanted me to or not, that's where you need to go this week. If anyone is ashamed of me and my message in these adulterous and sinful days, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in the glory of his Father and with the holy angels. If we're so ashamed of Jesus that we won't live our lives the way that we're supposed to live our lives, He tells us plainly what his response is going to be when we stand before him for judgment. It's not going to be pretty. It's not one of those, oh, I know it was kind of hard. You know how kids grow ashamed of their parents? I remember those days, and I can see Olivia's already headed down that route. The days will soon pass where she'll run up to me and give me a great big hug whenever she sees me. It's not like with my daughter, if she's ashamed of me, that I'm going to stop being her parent. I mean, I'll comply when she asks me to drop her off three blocks from school. I'll I'll comply when she said, Dad, please don't say anything, unless it's to a young man who's wanting to date her, in which case I'm going to have a big gun that I'm going to be cleaning. Bobby, I followed some of your posts on Facebook. I'm going to be right there with you, cleaning the gun collection when the guys come in. Your pants are sagging. I can help you with that. i got a nail gun out in the garage. <clears throat> you see, it's not, it's not just a, parent or a, a typical shame here. What Jesus is saying is, if you're ashamed of me and if you don't understand that this is more important than this, it's not going to go well for you. If we're ashamed of Jesus... We're going to have a pretty warm eternity. If anyone is ashamed of him or of his message, and he understands these adulterous and sinful days, get that. He put this phrase in there I understand that the days are hard and it's not cool to follow me, but if anyone is ashamed of me, And the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. You know, we sang this morning, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We talked about what it's going to be like to stand and hear all of the angels singing. But what do you think it will be like if we're 
not in heaven listening to that, but if we're in hell listening to that. I mean, we're still going to hear those angels singing. We're still going to be aware of who Jesus is and wish we had made that decision. You know, I remember when I was in high school and I'd make a lot of stupid decisions to be cool. The truth was, I never was cool and I never will be cool. It's not how I'm wired. I'm okay with that. But do we do the same thing in our adult lives? Do we give up on or hide the fact that we're following Jesus because, well, I don't want anybody to think I'm weird? Because it's going to be an awful long eternity to think back on those moments and say, oh, you know, it wouldn't have been so bad to, you know, be embarrassed for a second versus eternity. It's kind of like losing a tooth or getting a shot. You know, the pain is momentary. And then you get on. But if you don't have it done, the pain will be long-lived. Is anything worth more than our souls? Anything? I don't think so. And I guess the question that each one of us has to ask ourselves is, is anything worth more than our souls? You're going to leave this place in a few minutes. And when you leave this place, you're going to do a variety of things. Some of you are going to go and get in your car and drive to a nice restaurant. You're going to have a nice lunch. Some of you are going to get fast food on the way to wherever you're going. Some of you are going to go home and enjoy a nice meal around the table. You may mention, oh, you, you remember that part of pastor's message? Yeah, the rope was cool. Didn't get the rest of it, but the rope was cool. When you're doing whatever it is you're going to be doing, I want you to keep in mind this question. Is anything worth more than your soul? Is there anything that you can do on this life, in this life, that is more important than this? Is that new car you're wanting worth more than this? No offense to the car salesman in the cloud. It's not worth more than this. It's going to rust long before you even get to this point. It's going to be gone. This morning as our worship team comes, and as we prepare to close... The question before us is what's important? Is our soul the most important thing? Or are we living for this one sliver of the green tape in our lives? I want you to take a moment and think about that. And then we're going to stand and we're going to sing our closing song of I Refuse. I refuse to live my life focusing on the blue, red, yellow, or green, but instead choose to focus on eternity. Heavenly Father, as we take some time to ponder these thoughts, I ask that you would speak clearly to our hearts pointing out areas where we're way too focused on something in this earth, in this life that is going to fade and point us to the things that will last for all eternity. We spend so much time working and doing things outside of the church that we don't have time to invest in the lives of kids or teens or adults in the church. We just have too many things going on that we're involved in to see the eternal difference of investing in others. Because the only thing that we can take with us into eternity is people. How many are we going to take? And where are they following us to? Each 
Easy questions to answer on a mental level. Very difficult to put into practice. But help us to make the right decisions. In your name we pray. Amen. Stand with us as we sing. Heavenly Father, help us to refuse to live our lives for the unimportant, but to instead focus on the choices that will be the right choices to make for all eternity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And you are dismissed.